morning. All right, everybody got their notebooks. A lot to cover this morning. So only about 10 of the typography assignments done. I would encourage you not to fall behind in this class. Students who fall behind just never end up finishing the class. <clears throat> there just ends up being too much work. Uh, the important thing to take away from the typography, the, the typography assignment in general a few first principles slash best practices. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. It may seem like I've laid out a lot of rules here in terms of putting typography on the screen, and that's true, I have. Uh, why have I done that? Because uh, I find over the course of doing this a bunch of times that uh, typography decisions tend to be where a lot of beginning designers try to put their, you know, their personal touch on their work. And I can't advise you more against that in terms of per, uh, doing it in typography. Um, your images, we're image makers, right? We're making images that move here is where you want to make your mark. Um, the problem is, all right, can you be a typography artist? Yeah, certainly. Is that what this class is about? Nope, not at all. Um, and students often make uh, disqualifying decisions in terms of typography, right? The kind of bad font choices that would get your stuff just not looked at by professionals, right? You put your name on the screen and you've chosen such a poor font that they don't even look at the rest of the stuff, right? Um, and so I try to encourage everybody to be, in terms of what font choices and how you make type appear on the screen, uh, to be conservative. Uh, in terms of the design there. Uh, that's not where you're going to get a job or not get a job, right? Uh, for, if they're looking for someone to design a font, that's a completely different, um, completely different you know, person most of the time. You know, it's not, there's a whole lot of very particular knowledge base for doing that. And you know, we don't really cover any of that in this class. This isn't about that. Um, and so I try to lay out uh, an easy path for you as far as that goes. One, um, everything Ina says about typography and motion is great here. Um, I can't recommend this series enough. Uh, the Future is a great design resource if you haven't already checked this out. Um, so this is uh, Chris, that's Chris Doe right there. Uh, he runs a design studio called Blind, and he also does a lot of online design education. Uh, so they, some motion design, some just general graphic design, you should check out their entire YouTube channel. A lot of really great content there. But uh, their stuff about typography is what I've list, uh, listed here particularly. He has this uh, typography manual, which I think is very valuable. And then this is a really interested 
really interesting animated version of that manual as far as putting type on screen uh, in a very readable, very clear way. And so that's pretty much what this one is about. All of the stuff, um, students tend to silo the assignments where they're, they fulfill the requirements for the assignment and then forget about it. And no, 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 don't do that. Um, everything here is cumulative, right? So these rules for typography uh, continue to apply for the rest of the semester. If you put type on screen, it's got to be one of our whitelisted fonts, right? And I've provided all those fonts for you already here in a zip, which you all installed for this project. And so don't uh, continue to follow these rules about putting text on the screen for the entire semester in, in, all, in all cases. This goes for everything. This, this class is not sort of the kind of class where it's like you do one assignment and then you do the next assignment. This is about building a cumulative knowledge base. And so this is a critical part of the knowledge base. It may seem kind of dry, but like I said, um, this is the kind of thing where if you make some bad choices here, even if you're a great image maker, you're jeopardizing your you know, employability just by the fact that you've really um, exhibited some poor choices in terms of, of typography. Um, and so not only in the font choice uh, is there, should I, I encourage you to be conservative, but also in the animation of the font, or any, or any typography on screen, uh, which is why we went over uh, a few different options here, conservative options for fading and whatnot. And yeah, just as if um, you, can, you should consider this like a dangerous area as far as uh, choosing a font. There's many, many, many on the computer, right? But, eh, you know, five or so will get you what you need and, you know, not, make, not be horrible for your design, right? The same with uh, animating type. Uh, After Effects has, you know, I don't even know how many hundreds of preset type animations, and I probably use two on a regular basis, right? Because the other ones are just super hokey, um, you know, like type flying in. And why this is so important, um, because it's kind of, of a different visual category than our image making. When you put type on screen, our, this comes back to this first principle read words. We're all conditioned to do this by reading, right? As soon as you see any words on the screen or on paper, you're going to start to assimilate them, right? Read them. And anything you do as a barrier to that is bad. Um, that's just super frustrating for whoever's trying to read it, right? Uh, and so like weird fonts, type jumping around the screen, all that kind of stuff. Um, not not only does it like not look good from just like a pure visual design layout, but it also adds this additional layer of frustration for the viewer because there there's this additional level of cognition happening as far as reading what's on the screen, right? And so you can access a level of frustration in your viewer that you know usually is not available as far as just putting an if you know some sort of image or icon on the screen that's moving around, that also may not be great design, but wouldn't be as frustrating as putting bad type on the screen. And that's also why I used to do this later on in the semester, but now I do it. Uh, yeah, you know, what are we? Second week, so that uh, this can really sink in over the course of the semester. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. So th this one, you know, uh, really take this seriously here um, yeah and in, in terms of well you know uh, throughout all the assignments I'm trying to turn you on to different resources and designers and you know future learning opportunities Chris Doe is one of those his whole site I would bookmark I would follow him on Twitter on Instagram on all those kind of things um, you know definitely 
and in addition to graphic design fundamentals, the business of doing design business, he focuses a lot on that. Um, a lot of great material on his channel about that kind of thing. Um, if you come down here, let's see just what's on there now. And there's a, uh, in addition to sort of his, he, he has a lot of opinions about stuff. So keep that in mind. Uh, he's not shy about sharing his stuff. Um, but then there's also, they also occasionally do um, breakdowns or critiques on this channel. He's been doing a lot of like solo to the camera stuff here on YouTube. But they do, uh, you know, where they invite people on and do portfolio reviews. There's a lot of great stuff on this channel. Super good. Cool. So if you haven't gotten that one done, I mean, ASAP. What's his name? Chris Doe. Chris D-O. The Chris Doe. Of course, I can't just look at an Instagram. I need to sign in the Instagram. Great. We're going to drill down on some more keyframing and principles of animation. We're going to do. I'll do this one this week. Let's see. Today is the 31st, so this will have to be next week. Is that right? The 7th? Yeah. Cool. Um, before we get into some of the specifics here, let's talk about uh, up until now we've been sort of bringing, just drawing some shapes in After Effects. And let's get away from that because I said uh, before, it, it's not really a program for drawing stuff. Um, this is a program for compositing and keyframing and animating. Um, so let's draw something and bring it in. When we're bringing things in from uh, any program, right? We have some some options here. I would say the first two options are that things are coming from, you know, Illustrator, and out of Illustrator you have an AI file, or you're coming out of Photoshop, and that's going to give you a PSD file, right? Those would be the two main primary ways of you know content coming into After Effects. Those would be the ones with the least amount of friction, right? Because those are also Adobe programs, all part of the Creative Suite, and kind of how all this is designed to work. And just again, what type of images does Illustrator make? Vector, right? What does that mean? Katie, right? Katie. What what does a vector allow you to do? Enlarge and contract without losing the quality. It doesn't pixelate. Right, doesn't yeah. pixelate because it's not pixels, not pixels. It's the instructions to draw the pixels, and so you can draw it clearly at a small size or a large size. PSD coming out of Photoshop. What's the name for? What's the other name for pixels? Raster. Raster image, right? Pixels. Vector versus raster. Which one should you use? It depends, right? Uh, a lot of times people are handing off assets to you created in one or the other. Um, almost always logos 
are Illustrator files, right? If, if you are working on a project where someone says they don't have a vector of their logo, that may be a red flag. Okay, Almost always, logos are vectors. Um, why? Because they're usually simplified graphics of some kind, and you want them to look good at any resolution. So you want to be able to put your logo on your business card. You also want to be able to put your logo on a billboard, right? And not have to... Um, the easiest way to do that is to use a vector graphic. A PSD is a bunch of pixels, right? And fundamentally tied to the amount of um, pixels and the resolution of the document, right? There's that resolution word again. And what resolution are we working at most of the semester? 1920 by That's it. Got to memorize those numbers. 1920 by 1080. What's the other name for, those, for that specific box? High definition. Is that how you spell definition? D E F E I definition. Nope, that looks wrong. Mm, it's one or the other. My auto type thing here doesn't have spell, uh, spell check. So when you're using, when you're coming out of Photoshop, because it is a bunch of pixels, the resolution is going to matter more. When you're coming out of Illustrator, the resolution of the document doesn't matter as much because you'll be able to say, hey, this is a vector, and you'll be able to make it crisp kind of regardless of the resolution. The Let's look at this. So I'm in Illustrator here, and I'll, let's draw something to bring in. Um, as far as which template to start off with, if you start off with uh, the one for film or screen, right? so there's a couple different versions of this window. But um, this does a few things for you right off the bat. It uh, makes it the same size as our window, which is OK, but kind of irrelevant, right? We can resize this however we want. And then number two, it um, more importantly, it gives you the transparent background, which is the main um, mistake students make uh, bringing things in from Illustrator. right? They don't tell it to have a transparent background. It ends up coming in as a white background, which obviously is not great for compositing. Everybody understands that at this much at this point. The other um, metric you guys need to be aware of is that in this class everything we do goes on a screen right we don't make any print we don't print any there's not there is a printer in here i can't say there's no printer in it. there is one printer in here but the truth is i almost can never get it to work so i can't print anything in here right so no printing there's no printing happening here um, when you're dealing with anything going for a screen it's going to be 72 ppi pixels per inch or DPI. For our purposes, we're not really, those two uh, are kind of the same. I know if you're going into print, it's different, but that's because that's the pixel resolution of screens for the most part. When you're working in Michelle's class or any of the graphic design classes and you're going to print something, what is the pixel density for that? Yep, 300. Right? And so this is critical in that when you make uh, this type of document, it uh, automatically sets both of those things. It'll give you a transparent background. And if it doesn't crash, it will also make it 72. You need to be aware of this because a lot of the other uh, presets for Illustrator are designed for print. And things will come in as 72. Right, So if I come in here, or 300 rather, if I go to File, new right all of these things over here that's the resolution we're working at we see that it's 72 ppi right which is what we want and then also this so these are the two main things that are different from print we want rgb 
not CMYK. CMYK color space is for printing. Again, we're not printing. We don't care about that. Uh, we want 72, not 300. And by just clicking the um, video HD option, it automatically sets both those things. But you need to be aware that that's why we're pre clicking that button, so that both of these things are set appropriately so that um, things work out. Those are the two things. When you're dealing with programs that also do things for print, it's important to realize that, that you're not working in CMYK color space because all screens are RGB, right? We've got red pixels, we've got green pixels and blue pixels, and those light up. We don't have cyan, magenta, and yellow pixels. And we want to be at the right uh, pixel density. And uh, when you make that type of document in Illustrator, it also gives you the uh, transparency grid, right? This, when you see this checkerboard pattern, this is the uh, program commuting, communicating to you that this is see-through, which is obviously what we want in our case, so that's easier for compositing, mixing it in with other stuff, right? Cool, let's uh, make some sort of like hammer thing real quick. something like that and uh, I got a croquet hammer kind of like this there we go and maybe make one more shape the other thing I see a lot of people do is draw things with a stroke because that's the default. I can't encourage, this is another first principle. Regardless of the program, regardless of whatever you're doing, don't take the defaults. The people who design these programs are starting to get more hip to this in that they're making better choices about like what is the default of this program after they find out that like, oh, the, the program does all this stuff, but no one ever does it. Why don't they do it? Because they just take whatever the default is. Um, you have your own vision outside of the computer. You can use this as a tool to implement that and not just let the computer make decisions. It's not even the computer, not like the, the program designers make decisions about the image just because that's the default of the image, right? Um, and so one of those instances here is using a stroke. And I would say, Almost always as a stylistic choice here. Um, let's not use strokes right now on this. It tends to be more problematic from a bunch of reasons, but th that's just you know a sort of short-term issue here. Um, a lot of students, I just I emphasize that one here because a lot of times um, people are just turn in stuff that looks like this, where it's like uh, you know has a one-pixel stroke on it for no intentional reason. Yeah, I think you can do that. Stroke. I'm just going to put zero. Yeah. Zero. Well, I mean, once you make it zero, then it's, it's just this. It's the transparent. Yeah, yeah, like that. I just did. Like yeah. the, it right, says so one. I come in here and just put zero, and then no stroke. The other thing is, well, let's, let's leave it at that. Let's give this some sort of color, I guess. Uh, mm -mm. And I want to round the corners on this handle as well. All right, this is like a, like a croquet mallet. We're going to have it hit, hit a ball. What is the zoom?
rounding these edges. sort of ball. Cool. All right, so I've got these as, um, I'm going to leave them white right now to demonstrate one other thing is that, um, you know, making something in grayscale will give you um, the flexibility to, to adjust the color later on in After Effects in a much more um, dynamic way. So that, um, let's learn about that as well here. Cool, all right, so I've got, uh, I've got a hammer and a ball. I'm not super concerned about the size of these objects compared to the size of the frame. Why am I not concerned about that in this instance? Because these are vectors. I will be able to resize them uh, in After Effects, and it'll be cool. It'll still look crisp and clean. And so in that instance, I'm going to go ahead and save as. Oh, Adobe, stop. Of course I want to save it on my computer. Here we go. And let's put it on my data drive. And call this hammer. And we're good there. Let's come back here. Here's Hammer. And an Illustrator file, you know, anything from Adobe that's going to work in After Effects, you should be able to just drag in there. And here's our other rule. Th what I drew was just one layer, right? We're just one. Um, however, in the future, you may have you know, multi-layer um, Illustrator documents. And so you always want to import these as composition. It'll give you this option here, is whether you want it to be footage or composition. And we want composition. Why do we want composition? Because that gives us access to the layers. If we don't, uh, we're not going to use that right now, but that's almost always preferable. So this goes for both AI and PSD. You can make assets in Illustrator or Photoshop that have multiple layers and import them into After Effects. And if you use composition, you can have access to those layers in After Effects. This also is true of Procreate, right? If you're using Procreate on your tablet, you can export PSD and then have access to the individual layers as such. There's a couple other programs that do this too. I think any program that would export a PSD, if you, exp if you bring in the PSD, then um, you have access to the layers. Everybody with me there? Cool. So we are going to choose composition. We'll say OK. When you choose composition, you get a composition up here, and then also a folder with the layers. So if we had multiple layers, they would all be listed right here. We just have one layer right now. Um, and I'll bring, I can, this is the right size. So I'll say new comp from selection. There we go. Sorry, where did you? This is not a new, it's not new. What is it? What are you, composition? Export? Where do you find composition? The, I just made new, when you import it in that import window, it says, do you want to import it as footage or composition? Okay, okay, after effects, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now in here, um, if we were, if these were separate layers, we would be able to, you know, we, they would be separate here. Um, 
it's important to learn about one thing here is that we can we can cut things out pretty easily using masks here so the masking tool is something you use often in After Effects almost always I'm using the pen tool so this is confusing at first because it depends on what you have selected if you have a layer selected the pen tool will draw a mask. Nothing selected, the pen tool will um, draw a shape. That one gets people here at the beginning often. There's a lot of tools like this in Photoshop, or after effects where the state of the program drastically affects the um, the uh, way the tool functions so I'll make sure my hammer is selected and then if I grab the pen tool I could mask these out I just want the hammer for it. Uh, so I'll just select the hammer. There we go. So now I have just the hammer on this layer. To demonstrate the opposite, I will have nothing selected. And now if I grab the pen tool and start clicking around, it makes a shape. Makes sense? Right, so that's a that's a that's an important one. So I'll come back here and mask out the hammer. It'd be great to have the ball as well. So I'll show you a trick. I could go ahead and bring this down. And then mask out the ball, right? Just sort of do the same thing again. Or I could copy paste the hammer and if you unfurl under mask here, there's a invert button, which gives you essentially the opposite, all the stuff you didn't mask. So if I press that, now this layer is essentially the ball. I should probably label these as such. And so I'll call this one ball. And so here's hammer, here's ball. So now they're separated out. They're separate. Why did I why did I need to separate them out in two separate things here? Exactly. Yeah. Without them, without separating them out, I wouldn't have been able to address their position or anything independently. Make sense? Cool. Now, before I start animating anything, I need to get something figured out. What is it? Anchor points, right. We talked about that. I have to, I'm really sorry. Could you please say, I just can't, I, guess, I don't know how you exported it into, how, what, was, what file type did you use to export it into? I just it? saved it as an AI file. Saved it as AI. Yeah, and just. Then it exported, you get, then you open up After Effects and import? I just drug it in there, or you yeah, can go to import, yeah. Before animate, anchor point. And remember, this tool up here, this is the anchor point tool. And so uh, we want this hammer to sort of swing. So where should the anchor point for the hammer be? The very end of the hammer. Exactly. So I'm going to take the anchor point tool. Remember, by default, the anchor point goes into, this is the anchor point thing right here, this little crosshairs. It goes into the middle of the comp. And so I need to put this over here. And then the ball, I need to put this in the center of the ball. Let's check this. There we go, that looks good.
There we go. So the anchor point's the right point there. Anchor point's at the right spot there. Let's we can check it further. If you go ahead and hit R on the hammer. There we go. That's what I'm looking for, right? Swinging. Same thing with the ball. It's in the middle because we want the ball to just sort of move. Let's save this file. I now have external assets in my project. And so how do I want to save this thing? Emily. Mm, that's not going to copy my external assets. Anybody want to help her out? Do you know? It is, exactly. Dependencies collect files. Why do I want to do that? It saves the After Effects project and the Illustrator document that we just brought in, right? We want to keep all of those together now at this point. And so I'm going to say collect files. It'll say I need to save first. That's fine. And so I'll go back to my data drive, a new folder, call this impact, or I call it uh, principles 2022. collect that. Cool. This comp is way too long. Great. And again, we did that because of this. If we come in here and look at it. There's the After Effects project, that's fine. But in here, the footage folder, and there is the Illustrator file now, right? So that those stay together. I would want to collect again if I added any more stuff to this. So I've got this and this, that's good, cool. Uh, let's make this composition a little bit shorter, maybe just six seconds. So I'm going to use those B and N keys. B for the beginning of a work area. I'm going to move my playhead to about six seconds, hit N. And then right here in the composition work area, I'm going to right click and say trim comp to work area. So now trim this down before it was way too long. Also important to do before you start animating so that your keyframe timing is not you know, way, way off. I'm going to scale these down a little bit. I'm not keyframing them, I'm just setting the scale on both of these. All right, I think we're in a position where we can start setting some, some keyframes for this. So we scaled them down, got them where they need to go. Let's double check one other thing, composition settings. Oh, what do we want this to be? 24. There we go. I noticed when I was glancing at my timeline, because halfway between 0 and 1 was 15 and not 12. Right? Because remember, this number over here is in hours, minutes, seconds, and what's the last one? Frames, right? Not uh, 
fractions of a second frames. Cool. Um, so let's do this. We want our hammer to sort of pull back and then hit the ball. Okay. Uh, and so what parameter am I going to animate here with this hammer? I want it to boom. What, what, uh, what thing do I actually need to keyframe? Is it going to be position, rotation, scale, or opacity? Rotation, right? Because we don't need to move this thing. We're, we set the anchor point so that it'll rotate around this uh, handle. So I'll hit R for rotation, and I'll turn on the key uh, stopwatch because that's the first step of keyframing in After Effects. I made sure that my playhead was in a place that, uh, that works. That's where I want my first keyframe. Remember, R will give me the shortcut for rotation. And once I start doing other things, remember, U will show me all of the parameters that are currently keyframed. Right now, only rotation is keyframed, and so it just shows me that. But U is a super handy one. All right, so it goes there, and then we want it to swing back. And so let's say back this way. And then we need it to swing forward through, uh, through the ball. So now I can grab the rotation here and swing through. And we want this to act as if it has weight. So it needs to go back and forth some. And so I'll have it swing back the other way but a little bit less, and then continue the same thing. A little bit less. A little bit less. Mm, a little bit less. Maybe it gets back to zero. So what I just did, I refer to this as blocking out the animation. Just sort of answering the basic questions. Where does it need to be and when? Does it look like it's swinging right now? No, not very much, right? I mean, it's kind of doing the right locations, but again, when we set keyframes in After Effects, the default is id linear. And like I said before, don't just take the defaults because they're the defaults. We need to ease this stuff. So let's come into the graph editor. It's where most of the work is done. I'm going to grab all of these keyframes. And we need some Bezier handles, right? Because right now we only have straight lines. Straight lines means no acceleration. We need curves. Curves equal change in speed, which is what we need. Because change in speed allows us to s make things look like they have weight, right? Because that's what gravity does. Gravity changes the speed. If you're falling, gravity is increasing speed. And if you've been thrown into the air, gravity is decreasing or working against your, uh, your speed at that point. Right? You have to do a lot of work to overcome gravity if you're trying to get into the air. Hence, rocket science being difficult, right? Not easy. Uh, so we hit the ease slash Bezier button down here. And that gives us curves on each, each handle. And so let's look at this. Oh. 
all right, better, right? Way better than it was before. Everybody feel, feel better, right? Before when it was linear and I played it back, it should, it should hurt your soul, right? As far as like, ugh, that looks really bad, right? You gotta, if nothing else in this class, you know, start to really examine the quality of motion. Right? That's part of the cycle here is that you need to look at what's going on and use your taste and your design sense to make changes about make changes to what's what's happening here. And so let's let's give this first one a little more velocity here. I'm gonna grab this first one and grab these handles and hold down shift. Why do I want to hold down shift? <coughs> if I don't hold down shift, it allows me to pull the handles up and down, right? Which allows you to get a problem like this. So I'll, I'll do this wrong as a way to demonstrate it here. So now, here, we're gonna be going past what the keyframe value is, which is generally not good. And so usually, unless I'm trying to do something specific, when I'm grabbing these handles to drag them out, I'm holding down shift so that it doesn't let me overshoot the value here. And so this dragging them out here is going to help exaggerate the sense of gravity in this first one. There we go. And so this is essentially the first strike here. If I drag this one out, it'll make this is a this is the steeper slope, steepest slope now. And so this is that is essentially that first downswing. And so that will give us a little bit more variety. Yeah, I'll probably do that for some of the other ones here. So I'm going to grab these and drag this out just a little bit and drag this out a little bit. Give me a little bit more of a weighted pendulum. At the end, it's a little, little extreme. Let's chill it out here at the end. Seems to go a little too slow, a little too fast at the end. I'm just going to space these out. So I'll grab this one, just move it over a little bit. Maybe grab all three of these and move them over a little bit. The other thing you want to be aware of is that over time, um, my goal here is not to create like the perfectly physically accurate pendulum. I'm trying to remember the math on this. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, I think it's that the time of each one actually doesn't change as it goes back and forth, right? Because in the real world, the pendulum, as it swings back and forth, the friction with the air is losing, the, you know, it's losing energy as it's converted to heat. However, um, in this case, two things to be aware of. You probably want the time of the swing going down a little bit with each swing. And number two, you really want to keep the spacing between the swings equal. If you make a swing lopsided on one side, you'll see it'll look strange. Right? When you, the evenness is gravity decreasing the back and forth swing. If you make it uneven, it's clear that like energy has been added to the system in some way, uh, which is not what we want in this instance. Cool. All right, so that works for now. I might move this one back. You know, it's more of like a crank up. It gives it more time to sort of get started. Right, more of a feeling that's being lifted there, right? Because that one's longer than the other ones. To save that. Cool, so far so good. Does this make sense, what's going on here? So a few key things. Let's make the ball move. We want to make the ball seem like it's 
you know, being really hit by the ball. And so what, Sophia, right? What parameter do I need to animate on the ball? Yeah, X position, exactly. And so we're gonna go ahead and hit P for position. And then we have this really annoying thing in After Effects that both of these are together. And so Jeremy, what do I need to do? Separate off, separate dimensions. That's right, I'm gonna right click on this and say separate dimensions. Again, doing that before I start keyframing anything. Right, that way I can just press the stopwatch on the X. In general, this is a good principle, good fundamental principle set the least amount of keyframes. Right, not only in terms of here, I'm not gonna move this up and down, so why would I keyframe anything on the Y, right? It's just gonna make things more complicated later on. But then also in terms of the motion, right? Um, if your motion is herky-jerky, that's almost always solved by getting rid of keyframes, right? If you have less keyframes, and you're able to connect them with smoother lines, it's going to smooth out the motion of whatever it is you're doing. So be as efficient as possible in, in the keyframes. OK, and so we need to time this right there is where we need to get this ball moving. And we want it to move and then slow down. So over here, we're going to move the ball across the screen, like so. There we go. And let's see how that looks. Doesn't look great. Why doesn't it look great? It's moving too slow, and it's also moving at the same speed the whole time, right? What should the bulb do? It should be fast here, and then slow over here. So we have the same issue. Let's go ahead and grab these. And then I'll bring in my Bezier handles. Cool. And so now, let's see if that's all the problem. No, it did not, right? Let's look at the ball. We do have a change in speed, but it's not exactly what we want yet, right? Because here, the dots are closer together, which means it's moving slowly, right? Remember, dots far apart is fast, dots close together is slow. So we go slow, fast, slow. And what do we want? We want fast and then slow. And so we need to adjust this one here. Again, slope equals speed. And so by making it a steep slope at the beginning and then less slope at the end, we're gonna go fast and then slow down. Kind of like so. There we go. Now it looks like the ball is being imparted with speed, and then it slows down. Logan, how's it going on the live stream there? We only got two people on the live stream. That's troubling. Obviously, you're, it's great you're there. Who else is on the live stream? Let me know if you guys got any questions on the live stream. Um, cool. Let's save this. Let's make it look better. Um, cool. So let's address color. Um, like I said before, there's this issue with defaults. Right? And when you put your work in front of people who do this kind of work, they know what the defaults are, right? Like they used After Effects. They know what it looks like when you open it up. And so you, ideally, you don't want your stuff to look like whatever the defaults are. Um, and so avoiding like just straight up black background with white stuff. And so if I want to make a background, I'm going to make a right, right click and say New Solid. And let's give it a, a gray. There we go. And I'll drag this down to the bottom. There we go. 
And let's go ahead and um, give these color. And so if I want to, in my li uh, library of effects, useful effects, tint will take, you know, black and white and add color. And so in this case, this is why um, I was showing you the idea of making these white and then being able to add color here. And so I'll select the hammer and I'll come over to effects and I'll look for tint and I'll put that on here. And so now I can map white to you know whatever I would want. Let's make it a little blue. Okay, there we go. And you could do the same thing with the ball. Tint. And let's map this to There we go. Better. The advantage to doing it this way, right? So for a simple asset like this, it makes sense. I'm not saying you need to do it this way every time. Why uh, would this be advantageous? Is that then you can control color in AE. And so if you submitted this to your artistic director or to your client, um, and they said, I like it, but now we need the hammer to be red. Well, if you had made it a specific color in Illustrator, you sort of would need to go back to Illustrator and then fix the color there and then bring that asset back in. By doing it this way, it gives you a little more flexibility in terms of your workflow in that all you need to do if you did it this way is go to your color, your tint, and change the color here, and you're done. Uh, so flexibility in workflow, right? You could certainly get the job done the other way, but um, once you start to understand how the programs work together, there's definitely things you can do to make your life easier. We'll run into this again and again, especially when it comes to taking stuff from Cinema 4D to After Effects, all this kind of thing. Um, I, I had you guys do this in the bouncing ball, remember? Uh, it was a grayscale. We did grayscale everywhere, right? The thing we brought in from uh, Cinema 4D was grayscale, and then we, we were able to add tint to it in After Effects, right? This doesn't work for everything. If it's a much more visually intricate thing, then you know, you're know you gonna need to be using the color when you're creating the asset. But for simple things like this, it's, it works pretty well. So it depends, right? There's the way all the programs here do many, many, many things. You guys are used to this now. You know, I'm trying to show you what I think is the best workflow, but there's always a bunch of different ways to get this, get the thing done. Um, cool. All right, so now we got that. We have color, so that looks better. Let's uh, plus this a little bit more. So one of the things is that we do have some fast motion. We can make it look, it looks, the, mo the quality of the motion here looks good. When you have fast assets, you're generally going to need to use two things to complete the illusion of speed. One option is using motion blur. Right, so this is going to blur when the object is moving quickly. And the other option is more of an animation based thing, which is a smear. We'll get into this some more coming up here. Motion blur is pretty easy. Uh, our button right here enables motion blur. More importantly, 
uh, motion blur can be turned on and off per layer. So for instance, let me turn it on here in the ball, right? So that's this circle with the little circles behind it, right? That's motion blur. And so if we hit this now, there we go. And if I can scrub now, you see that the ball is blurred. And if I play it at full speed, it helps the ball seem fast a lot, right? This is a big one where throughout the semester, again, this is a principle which sticks the entire time you're doing this, is that you want the, uh, in order for things to seem fast, you want them to um, have motion blur. Let's try the hammer. I'm not 100% sure. Let's see. I'll turn on motion blur on the hammer. That yeah, works pretty good. Sometimes with motion blur, um, yeah, you, you can run into issues when we're talking about rotational blur. Uh, the, yeah, this is fine. In this case, we solved our problem to make the speed way more obvious by enabling motion blur on both of these layers. When you now in After Effects, when you click this button, it, I think it automatically clicks this button up here, so that. Um, you know, this is like, do I want any motion blur at all in this entire comp? And then here is, do I want it on this layer or not? One other word about coming in from Illustrator. Let me demonstrate the, as we're talking about these buttons down here, which are the ones that are most important? This motion blur one is important. This makes things into a 3D layer. We're not gonna do anything with that right now, but that's an important one. And then this one right here, this one is incredibly important. If you, um, this is essentially the vector vector button right here. Allow me to demonstrate. I'll bring this in. There we go. And then I will scale it up a whole bunch. Okay, I scaled it a whole bunch. This is a vector from Illustrator, right? But it kind of looks like garbage. I thought we used vectors so that uh, we could avoid this. That's what this button does here. This button is essentially redraw the vector so that it looks crisp regardless of the scale. And so if I press that button on here, ta-da, off, <coughs> on. The ones here, not quite as critical because I made these smaller, right, than when we brought them in. And so in this case, not quite as, quite as important. But anytime you bring in a vector and it's not looking crisp, it's because this button here, right? If you hover over it, it's listed as a continuously, for vector layer, continuously rasterized. Right, which may seem confusing because raster is the word we used with Photoshop, right? But what it's saying here is that I'm going to take the vector and continuously, every frame, redraw the pixels to make them as crisp as possible based on the vector instructions. This, this button does not apply if you brought it in from Photoshop because there'd be no fundamental vector to uh, access there. Does that make sense for everybody? Right, the, key, the key here, the takeaway is that you know, most of the time when you bring things in from Illustrator, this button you know, is going to clean them up because they're vectors.
Make any sense? Any questions from you guys? Okay, let's, um, you're not, you're not going to get through the whole thing here, but let's go ahead and at least do the first steps. Give your, go ahead and make a couple shapes in Illustrator. I'll come over in a second. It, in, and then bring them in and let, let's set the goal of like getting them in here, getting the anchor points set, separating them out, right? What was the technique I used to separate them out? I drew a mask, right? That's an important one. Okay, go ahead and, and work it out. Yes. Can you place the blur somewhere else? I, mean, I know you can. How would you do that? So if you want the blur, like, for some reason, somewhere else, like a bird is flying and then flying, and flying. you can place the blur at different points? Um, you mean, like, just make the blur longer? Like, so that it would be more of a trail? Well, no, let's just say that, let's say you're doing a show of pinball machine, and you have, you know, so you want you might want the ball to blur at each point. Uh -huh. you have to blur it at certain key frames or something. Yeah, I mean, for something more stylized like that, you'd be doing something where maybe each ball would be a separate layer, and then there'd be stuff going in between. Like it would have to be way more of a specific context. There. Otherwise, it just applies a default blur. Like you can the default the, the default blur is adjustable in yeah. your comp that's what, that's what in your composition settings. Okay. So under under our motion blur shutter angle and shutter phase. So if you want more blurring here, and then this is generally what we're using for you know shape layer stuff. There's also a motion blur effect which allows you to drill down a lot more on the quality and length of the blur and whatnot. And when we get into smearing, there's also more controls there as far as like the length of the smear and, and quality of the smear and all that sort of thing. Everybody have fun with the writing assignment this weekend? Checking out the motion graphic stuff?
I did brought them both in in one layer so that I could demonstrate the mask thing. Okay. So, yeah, I, I didn't I didn't use any layers. I just used one layer in in uh, Illustrator. You could use two layers. That's fine. Because then, when you bring it in as composition, it would already be separated. You wouldn't have to mask them out. But what about the strong or duplicate what you did? Your hammer doesn't have to look like my hammer. Could look more like a croquet hammer. Could look like a ball peen hammer. Could do a baseball bat. That'd be fun. Cricket bat? Is that what they call those? Anybody know? I have no idea. Is it a bat? Is it a paddle? Yeah, I guess they call it a bat.
You guys got your stuff into After Effects? Once you're into After Effects, you got to mask, mask out the stuff, and you've got to set the angle. The bolt disappears as soon as I do the mask. Right, that's what the mask does. Oops, okay. Um, can you tell me again where the anchor point? I want to be able to move the anchor point. So I'm going to un unclick it. It's over here, right? Is that not the anchor point for this layer? But I want to I wanna move the anchor point to here. Okay, well, hold on. Do, do the mask first. Do the mask first. Yeah, so finish finish the mask there. Just you know, draw, draw it around the. You're in the right tool. Yeah. Does it mean anything that it changed to pink? No, it uh, randomly um, oh. is a color. Because you can have multiple masks on one layer. Mm -hmm. So, so just so you can tell. Okay, so that's good. Okay. Now, go down to the anchor point and turn off the stopwatch. We're not going to animate the anchor point. We just need to move it. Right. So we're not changing its value at any point. We just need to set it. To separate. Okay, separate the two. Right? No, no, no. We, we, should, we just. Should I not do that? No. no okay. You don't need to. Just go to the anchor point. Okay. Hold on. If you control Z, you start drawing another mask there. See that orange dot up there? That's the beginning of the shot. There you go. All right. So now just go to the anchor point tool. Which is where? I don't know where. Is that? Mm -hmm. No, it's the square looking thing. Right there. Shortcut it for that oh, right. is okay. Y. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good shortcut to remember. Okay, so now go ahead and grab Oh, what's the shortcut you said? Y. Y? Y. Yeah. Most of the time in After Effects, I'm going back and forth between Y and V. Y is the anchor point tool, and V is the move tool. Those are definitely two good ones. Okay, so now, yeah, I, and almost, I almost, am, I can't think of a time when I animated the anchor point. You, that's really. Oh, hard. so this is anim. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You only you only turn on the stopwatch if you're gonna ch if you're gonna animate that thing. Mm. We don't want to animate the anchor point. We just want to set it. So setting it is just placing it. And yeah. Enter. Or yeah. You don't need to. You just move it to where you want. It. So okay. you just grab it there in the middle. It's right there in the middle. And move it to the handle. Okay. Okay. Right. And so now. Right, because we're not going to animate that. We're, in, in going forward, I almost never animate it, right? Because if you move the anchor point, it changes the way all the other stuff works, which is usually bad. So now you're good. You can go ahead and check by hitting R for rotation. Okay. And then go ahead and rotate a little bit. It should swing. And it does. Okay. Now where's the ball? Okay, so now, when you do a mask, that's what the mask does. It, it allows you to select one part and only that part. So we just see that part, right? You're just showing me mm -hmm. the thing. And so the, you, the direct drag way is if you drag it down again, Oops. Okay. What? The, whole, the whole thing you drew, just drag another version down to the, the, oh. the whole Illustrator frame. Just, just drag it down. There you go. And so now, on this one, just mask out the ball, right? And so then this one becomes the ball. Why are there two of these? Oh, because you have, came you have another have, layer. Yeah, yeah, you have it masked out. Uh -huh. so. Defend tool, right? And now just get the ball. There you go. Uh -huh. And so then, same thing. Once you finish the mask, move the anchor point to the middle of the ball. 
How's it going on the live stream? I see Logan's there. Logan's the only one who's revealed himself. At one point, we had three people watching the stream for a microsecond. It's weird how these statistics work on the stream. CrossFit, you wear weighted vests a lot. This is pretty much like that. You mm -hmm. put this in a backpack, you're kind of walking around with a weighted vest. Mm -hmm. Mm Everybody saving? When you rotate it, you're not animating it. You're just rotating it and then keying in the position of the X and Y. No, we, we are rotate. We are animating the rotation. That's that's what that's what this line is right here. Um, we we are not animating the anchor point. The anchor point is just set it and forget it. Rota rotation is the thing we're actually animating. You guys like like watching the video on Beeple? So do you know what happened to him? No. Well, that uh, video he made with LinkedIn Learning was like mm, I don't know three four years ago. You know, last year he was one of the first people to um, 
really make it big on NFTs. And so, you know, he his his uh, NFT of every days where he put all of his, you know, everyday sketches into one um, NFT was the one that, uh, you know, the first big NFT stole at Christie's for 69 million. So this this is, I mean, um, you know, the thing where he does work every day and posts it, this is all of them, or not all of them, how, whatever it's at, the first 5,000 days, all in one gigantic image that was an NFT. And this one auctioned for, for $69 million. So he doesn't have to work for clients anymore. keyframes at all on the on the hammer. It was all rotation. I see. So you, you can undo the stopwatch there. Yeah. So hit R for rotation so look at that. There. Yeah. And so now move the blade head first. No. Okay. And oh, yeah, I, I usually do rotation just by doing that. Yeah. I don't uh, oh. Right, so if you scrub now, you'll see that it'll go. <laughs> but you got, you got it moving. Okay, everybody save where you are, come back and grab your notebooks. Let me, let me finish talking about a few other things here and then I'll give you guys some more time to work because it's already 10.40. I want to make sure I get enough time to talk about a few other things. Sound good? And in general, Jeremy, I think it's better to sort of take notes while I'm talking and then work through. Yeah, yeah. trying to work along when I'm doing it is, um, I, d I think it just doesn't give your t brain time to like absorb the concepts first because there's a lot of interface stuff that, that gets in the way. You guys ready back there? Make sure you save. You don't need to close it, just save it. Cool, all right, so we got this one happening. Mm, let me just. Make sure the live stream's still going. Looks good. Okay, cool. So we got uh, one hammer hitting a ball. Nice. Um, let's let's uh, do another one here, another impact where we're going to make the ball seem heavy, All right? So we're, we're going to using the same setup, you know, the ball here, let's, let's make this one look lighter, first of all, so that we have a very um, uh, high degree of contrast, right? And so, in fact, I'm gonna come in here and rename this light ball. All right, and so what would make this ball look lighter? If it moved faster when, it, when the hammer hit it, right? and if it kept going. So let's do both of those things. Let's do the keep going first part. And so I'll come down here to the exposition of the ball. And so what would I need? I want this to keep going in this direction. I could do a couple things. I could come in here and make sure my playhead is at that keyframe. And this, if I, I could move this keyframe, if I move it up, it's gonna move further on the X axis. However, I feel that's more abstract in that you need to understand 
vertical placement on the graph equals horizontal placement on the screen, which becomes clear, but may not be clear right now. Or you can make sure that the playhead is over the ball or over that keyframe and hit V and sort of move it further so that it goes further off the screen. Again, I'm making sure that the playhead is, I want to adjust this keyframe. If the playhead is anywhere else and I move the ball, I'm not adjusting this keyframe, I'm adding a new keyframe, which is not what we want in this case. I just want to, I don't need to add any more keyframes, I just need to adjust the existing ones. And so I'm going to mouse over there, make sure it's lined up, um, and uh, V for the move tool, and move the, I'm going to hold down shift while I'm dragging it to the side so that I don't uh, move it up or down, and move it further off screen. And so let's see how that looks now. Better. Okay, so now we want it to move. I feel like it could be faster, right? And the curvature is going to make it faster. Also, without continuing to move this way, way, way off the screen, right? The speed is a function of how much ground are we covering in, in a certain amount of time. And so you, to make something faster, you could either cover more ground or reduce the amount of time. And so if I take this keyframe here and slide it to the left, I'm decreasing the amount of time it takes for the ball to move that far, hence making the ball go faster, right? And so let's try that. That's better. I feel like I wanna, want this to be more exaggerated. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this and move it over a few. And then I'm also going to grab this Bezier handle and get some more slope in there. There we go. I feel like that looks, looks like more of like a croquet hammer hitting a giant ping pong ball. I don't know, something like that. Make sense, the adjustments I made there? Cool. So now, the good news is, in order to, um, I want to make a, another one right down here where the ball appears to be heavy. And we're not going to make it heavy by making it bigger. We're going to try and communicate the weight of it only through the motion. So it visually will look the same, but we're going to make it act heavier. So let's do that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and grab both of these and control D, duplicate them. And so now I'll call this one heavy ball. And uh, up here, we'll call this hammer heavy. Uh, I want to move these. So I'll grab both of them and drag them down here Again, holding down shift try and keep them aligned just from a visual alignment standpoint and then down here you know just none of these are overlapping visually so it kind of doesn't matter their order here but in order to not drive myself insane I'm going to put them in the order that they appear here so hammer light and then hammer and heavy so that can keep it straight in my mind what's actually happening here. So I'll hit R for rotation, I'll get that one. I'll hit uh, P for position, I'll get that one. There we go. And this is uh, what I'm looking at on the graph down there. I have them both highlighted, and so it's showing me both of them at the same time. He's, this is useful in some instances. In this particular instance, um, in order for the, to fit them both on the graph, it needs to you know, uh, normalize the graph to some extent. And so it makes it hard to tell what's going on the with the rotation there. Like It looks kind of like a squiggly line. But if I just look at the rotation by itself, oh, OK, I, now I can see what's going on. Same information, just uh, renormalize of the graph. Cool. All right. So let's address the ball first in that now this ball needs to be heavy. And so we want it to go 
less distance. So this is where I would get the distance in there. And so let's move this back, holding down shift so it doesn't go, we'll have it stop maybe like there. Cool. Now, um, this is a great example here where um, my, see how my Bezier handles are really long? It's caused this to curve. Watch what happens now. So this is something you need to be careful of when you're dealing with the Bezier handles. If you drag them too far, you actually drive them past the, the keyframe, which when you're making animation like we're making it, where we block it out and then go, usually this is pretty undesirable, right? This is essentially overshoot what's happening here. probably next week, we'll do this on purpose, right? Because there's definitely a time and a place for this. If you want something to look like a spring and it goes, whoa, right? Then this would be good, right? Uh, but in this instance, this is doesn't make any sense, right? We hit a ball and it goes past and then, you know, this is uh, something that, you know, if we want something to look like a spring or if we want something to look more cartoonish, you know, depending on what uh, the situation would be. Anyways, let's let's bring this down here. So it's more like that. And maybe even a little bit less of a curve there. That's good. And we want it to take longer to get there. And so now I'm going to move this over to the left, or to the right, rather. You see it scales this curve so that it really takes a long time to roll to a stop. Make sense? Okay, so that I think that looks pretty good on the ball. As far as one ball, they both look identical as the hammer swings back, but then as the hammer makes impact, one of them is obviously super light and the other one is much, much heavier. It would also make a difference on the impact of the hammer, right? Depending on how heavy the ball is, it would actually sort of push the hammer back the other, the other direction. It'd be more like a, you know, things smacking off of each other. So let's see if we can make that happen with the hammer. Let's come in here to the rotation. And so you gotta remember, in this instance here with the hammer hitting, hitting this, oh, let me add one other word. Um, they both uh, copied the layers and so it copied everything it copied the motion blur right um, depending on your computer motion blur can be expensive right it needs to calculate things over multiple frames this can slow down you know when you hit play and after effects fills it up with green the more we learn the more buttons we can click the longer that can take Right? So it's important to realize which things can be expensive and which things are not. Motion blur can be expensive, in which case it may make sense to turn it off uh, on the entire thing while you're working and then turn it back on before you output uh, the final stuff so that it looks good. This will be something we do over and over again throughout the semester because a lot of times we want things to look good, but it slows down the program. You need to balance those two things. Cool, all right, so let's try this. Uh, we'll have this kind of like bounce off this ball. And so in this case, we're gonna need a separate keyframe here. Before, we didn't really have a keyframe at the instance the ball made impact. It wasn't necessary in our previous setup. And now we wanna have one. And so I'm going to add a keyframe here. You can do that with, you could adjust the value that would automatically make a keyframe, or you can press this guy right here, and that makes another keyframe, okay, either way. And this, now we want to 
have this uh, kind of bounce off here. And so this needs to go the other direction. Here, with this keyframe at the point of impact, we need to break these Bezier handles. Now holding down Alt, we did this in the bouncing ball project, right? Because this is a bounce now. Exact same thing. The, the, the part about breaking the Bezier handles, that's uh, once you do it, then you let go of the Alt. And so now, it bounces off of that. What I want to draw your attention to, and if you understand this, it'll help a lot. If I just showed you this, you would be like, oh, this looks like the keyframes from my bouncing ball homework, right? But this is not position, it's rotation. But the quality of a bounce looks the same here, right? We have a curvature down to a point reflecting off that point, right? And so we get this and that. Uh, let's tighten this up a little bit maybe here. And then, uh, you know, I could reset these or just sort of move them in the opposite direction either way because now it needs to So we communicated the weight of this. Here, let's, I think this, the heavy ball should move even a little bit less. And so let's go ahead and um, this final point here, I'm gonna drag that down. Again, I don't want that overshoot, so I'm keeping that as such. Yeah, I like that. Uh, let's not put labels on it this semester. I think we'll just do that. So I think it kind of takes away from it. All right, so what are the takeaways here? We're, we are communicating something about the objects only through their motion, right? This is, a, this is an exercise or an etude here in that Usually, if you're doing this, you'd also want to make the heavy thing probably look bigger, right? But we're trying to do it, we're just focusing in on one variable here. What is the variable? The motion of the objects. And by changing the motion of identically, visually identically objects, we can sort of key in on how we can use motion to communicate, in this case, mass. We can make one ball look super light and we can make the other ball look really heavy just in the way it interacts with something else, right? Two heavy things hit each other, and they kind of smack off each other, like the, the, in part. If the heavy hammer hits a light ball, it just sort of s smashes right through it, right? And doesn't um, bounce off of it. And so we're able to make something look heavy and make something look light just by doing that. Also, keep in mind here, remember how I went into the, uh, the issue of, of when we're visually displaying things, um, we want to think of this as a as a window, right? Not a not a box that we're putting stuff in. 
in this case, we're animating stuff so that you know it's just we want to see both of them on screen so we can compare it. That idea of a window versus a box. has to do with space. What is the equivalent in time? It is the edit. It is the cut. So it's for sort of the edit when we cut to the next scene is the equivalent thing in time. And one of the ways I can do that here, just in a very, very subtle way, is that you see I've moved the hammer swing keyframes uh, out past the end of the comp. And so when I comp this, you know, edit this together with the other scenes, the hammer will still be swinging when I edit to the next scene. And so it'll make it seem like this is something that continued to exist. I'm not having the hammer stop before I cut to the next scene. Does everybody understand the equivalence there? Right? When things out exist outside the window in space and we look around, it makes it seem like a part of a bigger thing. When we have things still happening when we edit, it makes it seem like they ha happened before and they'll continue to happen afterwards and we're showing you specific parts of it. We're not containing things within these parameters. Sound good? Cool, I like that one. That's a little bit different. We didn't do the hammers last semester. I think the hammers look good. Questions about uh, what we're doing here? Cool. All right. You guys go ahead and work on it here. I can answer questions. Logan, let me know how it's going for you there. And uh, nope, looks like it's just, just Logan right now. Here we go, stream update. Let's look. This morning's detendence has been disturbing. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Where did everybody go? We had a lot of people last week. Uh, we'll see. And since I got, you know, I'm going to end my work session, I'm going to save. And I am going to, what's the other thing we want to do to keep our data safe? Increment. Increment save. All right, so that in case my AEP file gets corrupted, hopefully, I still can go back to the previous AEP file and I'll be good. You said something, uh, I don't know if I wrote it down, but Vertical placement on the graph is horizontal. What on the screen? This is what I'm struggling with. The graph is well, this not is interpreting the graph. Yeah, so the graph, uh, in, in the case of the, this is only for the x coordinate, right? Yeah. And so this direction on the graph is always time. Right. Always. Yeah. Right, no matter what I'm looking at. Yeah. This direction mm -hmm. on the graph is whatever parameter it is I'm adjusting, right? And so for rotation, this was degrees of rotation, hence that one going up and down like this. For space, this is the x coordinate, and so as x goes up, the ball goes to the right. As for position. X, for position. So, so the, okay. Okay, so the variable the variable this is always is time, but the variable is whatever axis you're working with or whatever. Whatever parameter it is. Parameter. Yeah, y equals the parameter, x is time on the graph. This is where I'm just kind of struggling a little bit with interpreting the curve. I'm good. Okay. So you work. Okay. okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, the... Because when you look at them at the same time, this is the rotation changing, and this is the position changing. And so this is always time, for sure. Mm -hmm. And then this is whatever. You, know, you, you can't compare degrees here, because you're looking at like apples and oranges, right? Mm -hmm. this, this, why would you want to do this? Just to check out the time, to make sure that the bounce happened when the ball started moving, stuff like that, right? But this is rotation, and this is position. So you can't like compare. Oh, no, no. So what I was trying to explain to Bill what I was what I'm seeing. I don't know if it matters, but it's just a little. It's like if you're talking about a car that accelerates zero to sixty mm -hmm. over, and then and then you and then you want to show what happens in ten miles, but it stays at sixty. Mm -hmm. So. So you have to define the distance in this case, but the zero to 60, well, it, it's, it's hard to describe, but that's why I'm struggling with it, because I can't even describe it. Zero to 60, could, if I have miles an hour going this way, then my graph's gonna look like this, but then, but then it's just gonna stay, it's gonna continue at 60 for the whole rest of the miles. It doesn't accelerate anymore. Yeah, that's not a great metaphor here at the beginning. Because okay. speed is a such and such over such and such, right? And so, yes, the speed number increases and then stays the same. Um, but it, that doesn't translate to here in the same way. This does do what you're talking about. So if you right click, you can look at speed Right? And so by default, we're looking at the value, right? However, you can look at speed um, if you turn, if you click that box. And so this, this is the speed graph, right? And so here, the slope is sharpest when it's going fast, right? And so what, what are the fastest moments? The, here's where the ball starts moving, right? That's why we got a spike here. And here's where the ball, uh, the hammer, swings quickly, which is why we get a change there. So you, maybe this will click more with you. However, I think editing the speed graph can be more cumbersome here, which is why we start off doing the value graph as far as that yeah. being clearer. But you know what you're saying is not false but it may be a more cumbersome way to handle it here at the beginning. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing it that way, and it's not translating. So yeah. the way I'm seeing it. I, I mean, see. go ahead and give it a shot. I mean, if you no, just no, write I, it. I, <laughs> it's not working for the way that I'm seeing it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to you know, absorb mm -hmm. what this is indicating, and that's what I'm having trouble with. I've been looking at the other kind of graph for, for years. So <laughs> it's like trying to... Uh, Adapt to, the, to what the parameters are showing here. Yeah, yeah. It'll just mean it, it'll just mean that I'll have to work a lot with the, you know make sure I use the curve a lot instead, uh, instead of the dope sheet. You know? Yeah. How's it going? It's it's going. Yeah. What's your name? Your uh, Kevin. 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 Okay. Yeah. I was just sending some difficulties just uh, locally on the yeah. for uh, just an assignment. So uh, uh, I downloaded like, a bunch of these from a book I bought at uh -huh. the bookstore, uh -huh. right? And uh, the only footage I seemed to be getting was this, right? These ones. And I'm not quite sure how to like, put the footage manually. Yeah, so you're just importing it into Premiere, right? And so, I mean, you're saying that there should be more footage from yeah. the book? So, uh, specifically, like, I, for my like, first assignment, I needed, like, desert footage, right? All this stuff that I, sh I should have downloaded. I mean, it's 
Yeah, I mean, are you sure there wasn't more in the zip file? Because these are just Premier, like, you see these numbers are very large. There's no footage in the zip. This is just the Premier edit file. Oh, okay, okay. So, so you're saying I'm like never download the footage? So I, can I mean, there's, there's no footage in this folder. This is just Premier projects. Uh, they're all super small. So um, there's got to be some other, one more zip it. How big was the zip file? I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I mean, is it in your download folder right now? I mean, try downloading it again. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have the book. I should have the book. You mean like the physical book? Yeah, I don't have the physical book. Why do you need the physical book to download it? Uh, well, it just had instructions on that. Oh, uh, okay. I mean, sorry, yeah, sorry to bother you. No, yeah, like the, the, whatever you need is not in that folder. So I would try downloading it from the, from the book. Okay, thank you. So when you're doing this, the potential to move back and forth, I would try to just have keyframes changes direction. I wouldn't put keyframes in the middle. I just put that one in the middle and it bounces off. But otherwise, it just makes it harder to make it a smoother stuff. Yep, yep. Remember, less smoother motion, less keyframes. That allows you to, you know, let, let the curves do the work. That's what I think um, Alright, this is part of the uh, plus and minus of doing like motion capture work. When you do mocap stuff, usually those kind of recordings Thank you. are um, you have like a key frame on every frame, and so if you, which is great because it captures a lot of the fidelity of the movement. But if you need to edit anything, then that becomes a real hurdle because you know there's a key frame, key frame on every frame, and so. There's kind of things you can do. You can run some algorithms to do some data reduction on it, so that then you get something that looks more like curves, which is easier uh, to handle. But I was when I was doing the assignment with the bouncing ball, I realized like I I felt that I needed to keyframe every. Every frame? Every frame, because I wanted certain things to happen very precisely, and they weren't. So I was kept copying the coordinates so that it, it just seemed like I needed to do it that way. Like, kind of, it looks like bracketing, mm -hmm. so that you have, so you have this, it, it, otherwise it defaults to easing. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Right. It defaults to, like, I'll, I'll get there, you know, the bouncing ball, like, oh, I'll get there on the ease. But if I want to make it do something very specific, I needed to keyframe everything, right? But well, no, I mean, here, we're, we're essentially doing that by controlling the curvature of the line, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, because when it breaks down, this it is, it is that, but we are just controlling it in a more efficient way by worrying about this point and this point and the curve in between. But the curve in between does break it down per frame. If you go in here and look at it per frame, you know. So you, you, did, you, only, you didn't um, 
I didn't see you keyframing every point of the swing. I, I keyframed the the ends of the swing where yeah. it, where it changes yeah. rotation, just like just like yeah. so. And I'm in the you right. Your time frame is how many seconds? Your work space? Six. Where it's going back and forth within that six seconds, you're not keyframing them, you're just creating the point of the resonance. That's right. Um, I mean, you, you can see that on the screen way more with position. That's essentially each of these frames is, each of these points is a frame. Uh, you don't really see that with the rotation frame. After, After Effects doesn't show that to you in, in that kind of way. But it's doing the same thing. But did, didn't you say you didn't use, you didn't key position, you said you just key rotation? I, the position of the ball, yeah. The ro it's the, I did rotation on the hammer and position on the ball. Right, because yeah, the ball has to move across the Yeah, screen. I'm just at the hammer right now. I mean, that means the yeah, the thing. hammer, the only thing you're keeping on the hammer is rotation, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's good? Yeah. Okay. 